Thank you very much once again for your kind invitation. So this morning we discussed about the ladies. Now it's about time to discuss about the gentlemen. So male hypogonadism. These are my conflict of interests. What we will do today, we will discuss the types of male hypogonadism, my common entity. We will get discuss the rather new concept of functional hypogonadism. And once again, as I did in the morning, I try to provide practical recommendation on, on functional hypogonadism. So let's start with the first one. What is male hypogonadism? It's of course the failure of the endocrine function, whereas the failure of the exocrine function of spermatogenesis is referred as male infertility. So who has hypogonadism? Let's start with our first example. A male, quite young, he complains of tiredness and fatigue, otherwise free personal history, he's rather tall, normal weight, lipomestia, we'll discuss about gynecomestia and uh, lipomestia this morning, small uh, penis, small for sure, and outly testicular volume, and in semen, azosperm. So how would you proceed with this? We took our basic medical history, we performed our basic physical examination, so it's time for the usual endocrine evaluation. He is undoubtedly hypogonadal with a very low total testosterone. FSH and LHs are not elevated, as you would expect. Uh, prolactin is normal. The endocrinologist will investigate the, the remaining of the anterior pituitary, he may even perform a pituitary MRI, no additional findings, and a karyotype is normal. So this is a clear example of a central problem, a problem at the level of hypothalamus or the pituitary, a failure at that level, and the archetype disease here is the Kalman syndrome. Actually, according to Peter Schneider, there are acquired and congenital reasons for why having such a hypo hypo situation and one, one, once again the Kalman syndrome is the main disease here. On the other hand you can see in this classification that there are hints of functional gonadotropin therapy or the use of some medication. So I will come to this uh, to the third part of my presentation. What have we to know about the uh, hypo hypo was it relative new that uh, as time goes by we discover new genes that there are possible causes of hypo hypo and roughly as a rule of thumb we have about identified about 30 genes that they explain 30 percent of the spectrum of hypo hypo we suspect that the remaining of them would be other genes that we will discover in the future but up to now we have this gene. The clinical picture is roughly the one we have discussed, but not necessarily exactly the same. There may be small differences uh, concerning the phenotype. What is important is, although these conditions have, of course, a genetic origin, a, a, genetic, a genetic origin, they may be reversible. So from time to time, you may consider of stopping testosterone replacement therapy and see if the function has been restored. The diagnosis is rather easy because uh, testosterone production is uh, very low, actually, less than 200 milligrams per DL, quite a distinction uh, compared to eugonadal men, and the gonadotropins are, of course, very low. There are some rare cases that they are uh, up to normal, you would say, but up to three or four, you almost never find an FSH or an, uh, or an LH more than four. In the majority would be something like zero point something or one point something. So you have a clear diagnosis there that it's not easy to be missed. What can we do about this? Of course, we have to treat the situation, to treat the comorbidities, if they are there. If it, this happened quite early in the life of, uh, of the young guy, we have to induce puberty. 
we have to treat hypogonadism in an adult in the form of, uh, of uh, testosterone replacement therapy. And of course, it's rather easy to restore fertility. Once again, there is no problem with the uh, testicles. The problem is with hypothalamus, and the epicuity gland. So theoretically, if you give gonadotropins, then you will restore uh, spermatogenesis. And you actually perform this in more than 80% of the cases. There are some cases that this takes time, more than half a year, one year, even one and a half year, but in the majority of cases, uh, you will do this. The problem sometimes is the, with the comorbidities, the endocrinologists know very well how, what to do with the delayed puberty. So, um, to, to make a, a long story short, you try to replace testosterone according to the age. So, you increase the testosterone unless you reach the, the adult uh, levels. Of course, how to perform uh, testosterone replacement therapy, and we already discussed about uh, male infertility. But once again, because the majority of them are of genetic origins, there are some uh, other comorbidities that may be difficult to diagnose. Uh, very uh, nice sign for a medical student is the bimanual manual synchinesia. So uh, you cannot do this. You have to and move your, both your hands together. You cannot do this. You cannot isolate one uh, hand. So, let's uh, go to another clear example. Male of 32, infertility, primary, so no children, tries for a couple of years. Bilateral gynecomastia, once again, we discussed it this morning. Behavioral problems at school, not something severe, actually. No obvious problem with a female partner. The sexual life is normal. This is the uh, clinical evaluation of the patient. What we are going to do, once again, semen analysis and the basic endocrine profile. Testosterone is lowish. It's low. We are referring to a 32-year uh, old man, but nothing compared to the previous example. The FSH is clearly high, as it is LH, prolactin is normal, SHBG is rather normal. What you would do in order to confirm a diagnosis, most probably you go for a karyotype, and there is a possibility to go once again to the archetype disease, which in this case is klein syndrome. So this is another clear case of a testicular problem, of hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism. Once again, I refer to Peter Schneider. You have congenital and acquired diseases. The archetype disease is a klein syndrome, but there are other causes of congenital diseases, and there are the acquired diseases. For once again, there are mentions to uh, some medication or some condition that may induce subtype, sub, this type of hypogonadism. Now the diagnosis in this, the diagnosis in these cases is not as clear as in hypo hypo. Of course, FSH would be high. This is the normal range, and this is what you would expect in a man, in a boy, in a man with klein effer syndrome. This is what you would expect concerning LH, the normal range, the reference range, and this is what you would expect. But there is quite an overlap in the level of testosterone concentration. This is the normal in nanomoles per liter, and this is what you would expect. So there is some production of testosterone. This man enters puberty, majority of them, so you lose them. The clinical picture is not as obvious as in hypo hypo. So you, you may miss an opportunity to discuss about this. What you are going to do in this situation, once again, you have to treat the patient, to treat the comorbidities, to treat the hypogonadism in terms of uh, testosterone replacement therapy. This is more or less the easy part. The difficult part is what to do concerning infertility, because in this case, we have an uh, internal uh, and intrinsic testicular uh, problem. So. Uh, there are not much many things that you could do. We could discuss it actually if you want. 
once again, this is a syndromic situation, so you have some comorbidities. Uh, these are rare, but they are dangerous, such as the male breast cancer, uh, some uh, uh, episodes of uh, cases of thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And of course, there are some other uh, things. This is a strange thing, once again, for the medical student, legasthenia. If you have, how is the name of that game, that you have letters and you try to compose a word, actually. Uh, you are not very good in this. If you have the letters, you cannot have the, the mental capability of producing words out of these uh, letters. Okay, so we deal so much with the clear-cut cases of male hypogonadism, the hyper and the hypogonadism. Now, now let's discuss the concept of functional hypogonadism and let's take this example. Now we have a male quite older, or 55 years old, but still young. He has some general symptoms such as tiredness and fatigue and he has some complaint concerning his sexual life, so low libido erectile dysfunction. He is obese with these characteristics with normal to low volume uh, testes. Once again, the basic endocrine evaluation, the testosterone is lower as you could expect to a man of uh, 50, 55 years old. FSH and LH, you would say that they are normal, but if there was no problem from the pituitary, you would expect to be quite higher, so they look normal. Prolactin is normal, SHBG is rather low, and what else you would do? For sure, this is a congress of metabolic syndrome. I would have a full metabolic profile, and you can see some disturbed parameters uh, there. So let's discuss a little bit about this functional hypogonadism. It's a failure, as, uh, in contradistinction with the previous two types, it's a failure of both hypothalamic and testicular uh, level. It is associated with advanced age and it is potentially reversible. That's why it's so important if you have, have to uh, do it. Now, compared to women that they have a well-defined situation, that is the menopause, that you have quite an abrupt uh, decline in estrogen con concentration, let's say around the age of 50, 51, there is no such a phenomenon in men. But, of course, there is a decline in the main hormone in testosterone. The best data I can give you come from the EMA study, so late onset hypogonadism in middle age and elderly men, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, something like 12 years ago. So this is what's happening in men. There is a decline as time goes by, from my 40s to my 70s something, there is a decline, nothing so abrupt, as the female menopause, but of course there is a decline in total testosterone. This is normal aging, I would say. This decline is even more abrupt concerning free testosterone, if you can measure it or calculate it. The strange thing is once again in contradistinction with the female, although it's a normal phenomenon, but anyway, FSH goes up with menopause, you would expect LH to go up, but it does not actually. You have to reach your 70s, uh, although the decline starts from the decades of 50s, uh, in order LH to start rising a little bit, trying to compensate the hypogonadism. SHGB goes up, actually, and this will increase total testosterone, but not at a, as a, as a, in a degree that would compensate for the loss of uh, testosterone. So this is normal. A, a, you would say, situation. But on the other hand, if this is normality, okay, I would not expect in my 70s to have the same testicular function as in my 20s, but still, I will not cross a line to be considered hypogonadal. But there is a percentage of population that goes uh, lower than the age indicates. And this is something like about 2% of the total population. So testosterone is lower than you would expect because of age alone, and you actually cross the line and having symptoms of 
hypogonadism. So it's something like this. So think about it. Let's take let's take as an example my uh, my city Thessaloniki with a convenient population of one million. So projected to your uh, cities, many cities in Egypt have a population even this uh, even Ismaili of around a million. So. Kalman syndrome has a reported prevalence of 1 out of 20,000. So you would expect 25 uh, men with Kalman syndrome in Ismailia. And most probably you will diagnose all of them because it's very prominent. The clinical picture is there. They will not uh, enter puberty and so on. Now concerning Kleineferter syndrome, which is much more prevalent, 1 out of 1,000, so half the population are males, you would expect to have 500 Kleineferter syndromes in Ismailia, but most probably you will be able to, uh, to diagnose only one quarter of them. You will lose the other cases. Uh, you will not be able to find it during the pediatric age or later on during the army. You, you always lose it. Even in, if you, they been referred to you as an infertility problem, you may not solve, not put the correct diagnosis there. But look about the functional hypogonadism. If we stick to the EMAS uh, data of affecting 2% of the population in Ismailia, if you go back, you would expect 10,000 of people like this, that they are beyond, below what you would expect for, uh, for uh, their age. So it's quite a prevalent problem, and we have to, to do something about uh, this. What else do we have to take under consideration? Of course, the metabolic syndrome, it's one of the causes that I'm going to be lower than my age uh, indicates. You may define it in uh, different ways. And look how, how important is obesity alone. These are the same slide I showed you before, but this time is according to the BMI. So the first over there, the first curve is normal BMI. These are overweight men and these are obese men. So look what is happening. If I am in my 50, so this is the care for the, uh, once again, for the normal weight men, and this is for the obese men. If I am in my 70s, I have higher testosterone compared to a man with, uh, in his 40s that is, uh, frankly, obese. So the effect of obesity alone in testosterone is actually paramount. And this is something that you have to, uh, to, uh, to know. It. And now, nowadays, we know the pathophysiology behind it. We know that the axis does not start from the pituitary, so FSH, LH, and testosterone production, but it starts, of course, in the hypothalamus. So before GnRH, you have other molecules such as NPY and his one. And actually, the whole axis starts from the periphery, from the adipose tissue. So it's the adipose tissue. When it's full, it produces leptin that acts centrally, centrally in order to, to open the axis. Now, men and women, but men with obesity, they develop a leptin resistance the same way they develop an insulin resistance. So the leptin actually has a resistance, so cannot start, cannot induce the, ax the, uh, the axis. That's why there is a central level to this functional hypogonadism. And of course, there are peripheral actions. There, are, there is evidence that leptin uh, acts directly to the testis, reducing the production of testosterone. So that's why the functional acts both at a central level, hypothalamus pituitary, and the peripheral level, and this is the rough pathophysiology behind this situation. Now we have good evidence, this is an old publication of ours with basic Tarlatis, that there is an interaction with, between metabolic syndrome and testicular dysfunction. So if you have testicular dysfunction, if you are hypogonadism, then your central obesity, for example, is going to be increased. And the opposite is true. If I am obese, especially with central type of obesity, I'm going to be more hypogonadal. So it's a true vicious circle uh, there. So the third type of hypogonadism we are discussing uh, today, it's much more prevalent than the classical one. Obesity and other uh, 
uh, parameters of metabolic syndrome or some medication or some comorbidities contribute independently of the age to this decline of testosterone. And this is actually functional hypogonadism as compared, as opposed to organic and classical causes. Once again, this is potentially reversible because many of the contributive factors for the uh, metabolic syndrome are reversible as uh, well. So the new classification proposed is that, yes, okay, for the primary hypogonadism, so the hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism, you have your organic and acquired causes, but you have your functional as well because of aging, drug induced, chronic um, uh, systemic illnesses, and so on, the causes as you can see there. And the same is true for secondary, for central, for hypo, hypo. You have the usual congenital and acquired causes, but there are the functional as well, and you can see there what's happening, especially concerning obesity, diabetes, and other comorbidities. I'm going to the third part, in the last minute, uh, providing some practical recommendation on how to diagnose, how to diagnose and how to treat this uh, disease. Let's start with the diagnosis. You need both. You need the clinical symptoms, so you have to ask, you perform your clinical examination, and to uh, verify this with low morning fasting, if you prefer uh, testosterone. So you need both the symptoms alone, because they are very generic, actually, non-specific, not uh, capable of setting the diagnosis, uh, not even the testosterone alone. You have to need uh, both. And if you want to ask some questions, actually, the most specific questions are the three sexual questions. So how frequently do you have an, an uh, automatic, spontaneous morning erection? I used to have, but not anymore. It's not happening every day, but it's happening in men from time to time. Uh, what about libido, uh, sexual desire, and of course, what about erectile function? So these three sexual questions, they have the best correlation with testosterone level. They are the most specific questions you can ask. Of course, other general questions could be there, the tiredness, the fatigue, the so on, but they are very generic. Almost all diseases can produce these uh, symptoms. So start with this. Don't afraid to ask this question to your men. Of course, clinical examination. If it took Michelangelo two years to construct David, it took me about two hours in the uh, PowerPoint to construct a hypogonadal David, actually, and all the features of hypogonadism, central obesity, uh, lipomastia are um, there. You need a well-validated uh, way of measuring testosterone. Sometimes this is not available. In endocrinology, we always prefer to measure the part the proportion of the uh, testosterone that does the job, and this is the free testosterone, but this is an exception. And it is an exception because it's difficult from a methodological point of view to measure directly uh, free testosterone. So what we usually do is measure total testosterone, it's much easier, and then we correct them by measuring the calculated free testosterone. If you have your SHBG, you can make this calculation is easy. Now, what about treatment? Lifestyle changes, it's, a, it's the same uh, principle that uh, we discussed this morning with women, so I'm going to lose central uh, fat and my testosterone may go up. I'm going to show you some data. If you believe to this interaction that testicular dysfunction may cause more metabolic syndrome, and more metabolic syndrome can produce even more testicular dysfunction, then if you treat one, the other would be benefited as well. Is this true? Well, yes, it is. And this is a meta-analysis by Giovanni Corona saying that if you lose weight, if you lose something like 5 to 10% of your body weight, your testosterone will go up for about 5 nanomoles per liter or 100, if you prefer, uh, milligrams per DL. So it's quite a lot. From 200 something, you may go to 300 something, and you are not hypogonadal anymore. So it works. The opposite is true, actually. If you give testosterone, you are going to 
uh, relieve some, uh, to elevate some parameters of metabolic syndrome. Uh, the total weight will not change, will not be changed, but this is because you lose fat and you gain lean mass. And this is, of course, a good change. So don't expect to see changes in the uh, total weight or the BMI, but you are going to see some changes in the body composition. Some other parameters, such as uh, glucose profile, uh, some lipids may be of benefit as well. We usually use, if it's available, transdermal testosterone. In the majority of the studies, use transdermal uh, testosterone for this therapy. We do not use at all nowadays testosterone pills. They are metabolized through the liver. They have very short heart life. So we use either injection every three weeks, may play with the interval, or every uh, 12 weeks, if these preparations are available according to the country, or you can use gel or patches, usually gels in the majority of the countries. Now, safety is a very important issue. Is it safe? We have the cardiologist with us concerning the cardiometabolic profile. And, of course, I would avoid to give testosterone in a man with uh, untreated prostate cancer or breast cancer. These changes are rare, but you have to check for this. And a patient with severe heart disease. But we have very new data, actually, published just one month ago, the famous Traverse study, that was looking exactly to this. If uh, testosterone replacement therapy is, this man is safe. So this is the study, something like 5,000 men with functional hypogonadism, so for 45 to 80 years, so they took uh, testosterone gel, they had testosterone less than 300 nanograms per deciliter, uh, and the main, the main end point was cardiovascular health. As, as you can see here, there was absolutely no difference, no increase in the events between the testosterone-treated group and the placebo-treated group. So it seems, and we have good evidence now for the first time, that it's a safe preparation, so no difference in almost everything. What you are going to do concerning monitoring, if you start testosterone, so you ask for energy, sexual function, fat-free mass, you would expect improvements. Uh, it will take some uh, more than a year to see a restoration of uh, bone mineral density if it was low because of testosterone. What I'm going to measure, some basic clinical parameters, physical examination, and to answer again, a basic a laboratory evaluation for obvious uh, reasons. So, what we have done today, we've discussed the classical type, let's say, of male hypogonadism, hyper-hypo and hypo-hypo. We'll discuss the concept of functional hypogonadism, and I try to provide practical recommendation about this entity. We know that testosterone replacement therapy is only for men who are truly hypogonadal, and we have to prove it, it's for the 1% or 2% of the population and not for every aging uh, man. It can be administered, actually, testosterone in all cases of hypogonadism, and it seems to be a safe approach according to the data we have. So you have to select the right patient, you have to inform him and involve him in the decision-making, you have to monitor uh, him, it's rather easy monitoring, and you have, you have to collaborate with other health professionals, with your cardiologists, with your urologists, actually, to form the team there in order to uh, uh, deal with this. If you want further reading, uh, this is the American approach, Endocrine Society, concerning the hypogonadal man, and this is our approach, if you prefer, the European approach by the European Academy of Amprology, we have a uh, small algorithm uh, there to provide for you. So you have to prove that there is uh, a clear uh, uh, hypogonadism. Otherwise, don't deal with this patient. You have to exclude primary or secondary hypogonadism. And then there may be a chance to uh, go for a testosterone uh, replacement uh, treatment in the men that do believe that they have functional 
hypogonadism. So I'm so happy that I am such a friendly city such as Ismailia and uh, you have our regards from another amazing city which is Thessaloniki. Thank you very much for your kind attendance. Uh, thank you, Dr. Demetrius, for your uh, uh, marvelous uh, lecture. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Ahmed Salem, uh, andrologist and urologist. Uh, I want to ask you about as a hypogonadism in, uh, as a cause of infertility. Do you give them direct testosterone replacement therapy or you start with uh, uh, HTG? Uh, also, what about the constitutional growth delay? Okay. Yeah. So concerning the first, the answer is absolutely no. The one case, of course, unless the contraindication, of course, breast cancer and untreated prostate uh, cancer, the one man that you are not going to give testosterone if uh, a man that wants to be a father. Even giving small doses of testosterone, this will actually uh, may close the axis so it will reduce spermatogenesis. So no testosterone in these cases with any form. Uh, uh, you may give, if FSH is not high, you may give some FSH, but not uh, testosterone. You may think of testosterone after he has completed his uh, family. Now, constitutional uh, delay of uh, pregnancy is another course. It's very difficult, as you know, to diagnose what is organic and what is constitutional. And the usual thing that we do in the clinical practice is that if it's a constitutional, of course, you ask for family history. This is the best you can do, actually, if his father was a late bloomer, let's say. Uh, so you take this under consideration. And it's the common practice is if you give testosterone in a man with constitutional delay, usually you prime the axis and then you have no problem, you stop and continue. Of course, if it's organic, if you stop testosterone, uh, the puberty will be arrested there. So that's a practical way to make the differentiation. Thank you very much. Do you, do you start in constitutional, constitutional growth delay or delayed puberty? Do you start with HCG or direct testosterone? That's another uh, thing that you, can, you have to consider with the patient. There is one school, let's say, that, that give testosterone, start it from low dose according to the age, then increase it and then go to the other. When it's time for uh, the family, when he's 30, let's say, then you can give gonadotropins there at that time because it's not like adrenals that they will forget to produce cortisol, actually. They always have the ability. There is another school saying that it's good to give LH, combination of LH and FSH, because you are going to increase the testicular size and this is good from psychological reasons for the young boys. Sometimes they compare their test, you know. So they submit. And then you, uh, there is some evidence, not the best in the world, that if you increase the testicular size, then you go with testosterone and the size will uh, diminish as well. But then it's easier when you try again in, your, uh, in, their, four, in their 30s, actually, to reduce spermatogenesis. So you can do both, actually, they are not compared in ink studies. Uh, I would go for the first as far as the cost is not involved. But actually, giving FSA, it may be costly. But giving HCG, it's not costly. So you can do this. It's, the cost is not very much for giving HCG or uh, uh, LH, actually. And... Uh, uh, have the, uh, this possible additional benefit of increasing the testicular uh, size and having better probability of finding again sperm in the future. I have one last question. So we have we are having this trend of uh, using testosterone, uh, testosterone by gymnasts yeah. uh, to gain more uh, muscle. Okay. Yeah. So uh, actually they are not using it for replacement. So they give very large doses. Yeah. So. Uh, how much you uh, how long usually it would take to restore the, yeah. the eggs back to normal and if there is any possibility that it will not be restored and yeah. if there is any uh, standardized regimens to restore uh, uh, the eggs back to normal does this exist yeah uh, can I have back my my slides is it possible no you went to the next one if it would be, I have a slide there I have not the time and we have the excellent discussion by Professor uh, 
Halawa this morning, so uh, you, you said everything actually, so I, I had nothing to, to add, but I could show you this. Uh, leave it to me, I will find the slide. So you virtually answered it, but it happens, I think, to have a, uh, something here for Professor Misak. Where is the, can you put it in full screen for me? Where is it? I could find it. Okay, we found it. So, uh, this is what happened in the normal, let's say, population. Some of them are infertile and they have low sperm count, but the majority, they are not. This is what happened to current bodybuilders, let's say. So, the majority of them have very low sperm, even ozospermia, but some of them not. This is the main problem with male contraception as well. If you give a contraceptive pill to, the, to a female, almost all will suppress FSH. But not all men will suppress spermatogenesis. Some of them, a minority, will continue to have a, 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 an amount of, of, of sperm. Look what happening if they stop uh, anabolic steroids uh, for uh, a small amount of time. So you do not have a new actually circle of, uh, of uh, spermatogenesis. Still the same picture. But then if they stop for more than 14 weeks, let's say three months, so you are in a new cycle of spermatogenesis, the majority of them will be restored, will be like the normal population, but still not all of them. For some reasons we do not understand, this reduction is uh, permanent, let's say, or it takes a lot of time. So this is another uh, reason not to use anabolic steroids. It's actually an excess, and they may have uh, uh, long-term consequences. We do not have good parameters to predict uh, if some of them will be restored uh, and some of them not. Thank you, Professor Demetrius, for your elegant presentation. Any question from the floor? And thank you uh, for your excellent presentation. You made my, my life easier. Uh, <laughs> I have a little comment about uh, what is going about diabetics, what we commonly see for functional hypogonadism, really a low testosterone even in the morning in diabetics and male diabetics age of 60s, and they have a problem of this. And most of them are referred to a uh, urologist about the problem of uh, you know, increased size of the prostate without prostatism or not. Do you treat them with small doses of testosterone replacement, even they have enlarged prostate? You are very true, uh, Professor. Actually, you would expect something like 30-40% of your patients with diabetes to be hypogonadal as well. Then you have to deal it with, uh, with their neurologists. They have to perform the examination, maybe digital examination. Of course, they are going to measure PSA to exclude an, uh, an untreated prostate cancer, which is not because of diabetes or other reasons, but it's common at this age, so you have to exclude this. And then if there is no excessive symptoms of prostatism, and urologists will say an IPSS more than 19, something like this, so you can measure it, Yes, there are candidates uh, for this. And you have to collaborate with your uh, urologist to see if there is an abrupt increase in PSA. What about the doses of testosterone replacement in these cases? Small dose or actual the full dose? Well, if you use... Uh, you are not targeting the level of testosterone. You are just replacing small amount to help them functionally. Exactly, you are right. So you are usually using gels or uh, injections? Gel. Gel. Or patches. So according to the, the best data I can show you, it was from the, this Traverse study that published uh, one month ago. So their target was testosterone for 300 to 700. So they went quite high. My target would be the low normal. If he is less than 300, to restore his testosterone to a little bit that 300. That's enough usually for a man at that age. Uh, even injection, we uh, make a duration monthly or uh, every exactly. six weeks. 
Exactly. So yeah. I would measure the because the sheep are then the patches. And the nadir just before the previous injection, and I would play with the duration of the injection: two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, according. Thank you, Professor. Any further questions? Thank you, Professor, for your elegant presentation, thank you. and thank you.